Hi, my name is Christopher David Mitchell. I'm a coach and today I am so pumped for this one. We're going to be talking about something so profound, so important. This is going to be one of the most important videos I've ever done because we're going to be talking about spiral dynamics, which is a model on how human beings psychologically develop, how they evolve. Literally, I've been wanting to put out this video for several years now. I cannot stress enough how important this episode will be if you care at all about growth, personal growth, development, uh, or you wonder about human psychology, human behavior, human motivation, why people behave in certain ways. I mean, whether it's business, personal life, politics, the nature of reality, there is so much value in this model of spiral dynamics. It's literally changed my life. Um, I cannot say enough great things about it. So if you can stick with me here for the rest of the video, I promise you, I promise you, you will learn more about human beings. You'll learn more about yourself as well, uh, where you're at on the journey of personal growth and development. And it can also just, like I say, hugely benefit all aspects of your life. So I've literally been contemplating this one, like I say, for a long time, over a year. This is going to be one of the most important videos I've ever shot. Stick with me here and it's going to be life-changing stuff. So obviously some acknowledgements before we start. I have to give full, full credit to the creators of this Spiral Dynamics model, of which I'm not affiliated to at all. All I'm sharing in this video is just because I think it's so life-changing amazing, I just wanna put it out there. But of course, full credit goes to the originator, I believe, which was Claire Graves, and then uh, the people who then furthered that research, uh, Don Beck and Christopher Cowan, I think his name is. Um, Yes, so I'm going to put the links for the book and the resources there, the official links of the official people. Full credit goes to them. I take no credit for any of this. I should also give a special mention to Leo Gura at Actualize.org. Now, although he's not affiliated to Spiral Dynamics at all, Leo has talked about Spiral Dynamics to death on his YouTube channel, which I'll link below in the description. And he's just a truly phenomenal teacher. I mean, he started off as a life coach and to see his journey and how he's evolved now, like I don't think anyone hardly understands the nature of reality better than Leo. He is just an incredible teacher. Um, I owe him so much and, you know, a lot of the insights are coming from him as well um, because he's just changed my life in so many ways. So I'm just going to do a quick, quick two minute overview just to give you an insight of what, what on earth we're talking about here with Spiral Dynamics before I go into a bit more depth on each stage. So what Spiral Dynamics is doing is it's researching how human beings evolve um, and it, it puts them in stages that it calls, that it calls each color. The color doesn't mean anything, I'm pretty sure. It's just a reference to what stage you're at. So we're going to be talking about the first stage, stage beige, purple, red, uh, then there's blue, orange, green, yellow, and turquoise, right? So it's quite a lot of little stages. So I'm gonna be going into in-depth. If you wanna miss, I'm gonna quickly go over the first few stages pretty quickly, because a lot of people who are viewing this, especially if you're in a first world country, are gonna be around the stage orange type um, level of development. So really, you know, if you wanted to just l learn about the level that you're at, then you might need to fast forward, but I would recommend not because you're not, I'm going to be doing loads of insights along the way and you're only going to get the true benefit from what I'm going to share here if you stick with me through the journey. But like I say, I'll move through the first few stages a bit quicker and then we'll go more in depth when we get around blue, orange and green because that's what's going to really resonate with you because that's where a lot of first world society sort of is these days. And another thing to quickly say is that you could be a mixture of stages and you probably are. So when we're seeing things like stage blue, stage orange, 
uh, you know, stage green. It's not that you're going to be 100% anything. You'll probably be a mixture of 30% here, 20% here, 50% there, etc., etc. So bear that in mind as we go through this model. Okay, so just a few little things before we start. One is, I already think what you should do if you really want to learn about it is buy the book and stuff like that. So how can I put my own personal experience on this? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all the stages in the spiral and talk about how, how I personally feel that I have um, experienced them or been affected by them. So I'm going to put my own personal spin on this, which is just my own life experience. And I'm also going to talk about each stage and I'm going to talk about what I think um, sex, drugs and business would look like at every stage and what the perfect day would look like for someone who's at every stage of this spiral. And just before we start, I just want to say use this model in a really responsible and right way, which is just to really assess where you feel that you're at on the spiral at the moment, how you can evolve. So I'll be giving tips for that. But don't use it in a, like a judgy way. Even though it might sound a bit like, you know, judgy to say someone's in this stage or this stage, you know, don't take that to heart and don't use it to, to sort of judge other people because really nothing's better necessarily. Of course, you could argue that it's sort of slightly better if the whole world does evolve, which it will over time as it always is. But um, really, it's, it's, it's not that anything's better. It's just that they're on a, on, on a different journey. They're just further along the path. But, you know, um, am I better now than, than I was at a kid or a teenager? Well, being a kid's a beautiful thing. Being a teenager's a beautiful thing. And being an adult's a beautiful thing. It's just different stages along the journey. Yes, it's better for society if we are further along because there'll be less problems in the world. But it's not necessarily a bad thing if you find yourself somewhere in the middle or slightly lower. It's just that then you've got the awareness and the consciousness and the open-mindedness to think, oh, how can I evolve a little bit if that's important to you? So don't use this as a model to attack people with. It's more about just realizing and being able to look inside on yourself of where you're at so you can improve your own personal journey. And then also by doing that in the end, you'll improve the rest of the world's journey. And one last quick thing before we start is come at this with an open mind, right? So a lot of people, you know, if I've tried to explain some of this, they're like, no, this isn't true or whatever. Well, it doesn't matter whether you don't believe in the spiral dynamics research model, look into Ken Wilber's research model, look into Suzanne cook -Greuter's research model. I mean, we're talking about a field here, which is human psychological development. And they're all very similar in ways when you look into them. So come with an open mind. Some of these thoughts might trigger you because you, you might be like, oh, that's the stage I'm at. Like, shit, I thought I was a bit higher or lower, et cetera, et cetera. So come in with an open mind and realize that we're talking about decades and decades of research here. And um, then, you know, that's the way to approach it and then you'll learn so much but it might be easy to get a bit triggered along the way but yeah try not to it's all cool i'll make it fun as we go as well okay so let's start with the first stage so the first stage which is technically the lowest stage if there was lower to higher remember none of these stages are necessarily better but there is an evolvement from lower to higher stages or you could do them from left to right here that they're getting more evolved as they're progressing. So stage one, the lowest stage would be beige, what they would describe as stage beige. Um, now beige, um, uh, that's a very survival mode. You could also think about this as like the, the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you're a person at beige, then literally you're just trying to survive. All you're trying to do is the survival um, the next day. So maybe something like, you know, you're in uh, an environment where you can hardly, you know, feed yourself or anything like that. Think about people who are severely disabled, unfortunately, uh, people who are really suffering from a mental illness, completely relying on anyone else. And the only good thing that could happen is that you just survive. So it's base, base, base survival. You could also think about this as like, you know, young children and something. 
you know, they're, they're not able to be developed on their own. They're completely relying on just survival day to day from someone looking after them. So, uh, I, like I said, I'm quickly running through beige because you're not going to be beige if you're watching this video. Um, but uh, an example of me uh, going through beige was when I was actually in hospital, right? So when I was in hospital and I had that near-death experience, um, I had a moment where I probably, you know, went to a, a beige state, which was pure, pure survival. Like, nothing else mattered. You could have given me money or relationships or anything. Because I was in such a low state of development at that point, uh, when you're lying there in hospital, all you're trying to do is survive. I think that's a, a beige state. Um, now, I'm, you know, I'm hopefully evolved along past that as a stage, but Ken Wilber talks about this, the difference between being in a state and a stage. So a state might mean you're just temporarily there. So I would say that when I was like, you know, hooked up in hospital to the machines, relying on everyone else and I'm lying there and I'm pretty paralyzed, I can't even go to the toilet properly, that would have been me accessing a bit of beige. So, like I say, it's pure, pure survival. So, I don't think we need to talk about that too much more. Uh, and, you know, the only drugs, because we were going to talk about sex, drugs and business, well, you don't even care about these things, really, when you're stage beige. But, um, yeah, if you did have any drugs, it would just be drugs to keep you alive at that stage. So, what would be the perfect day for beige? Well, beige, like I say, just at this very first stage, this very low stage, the only thing that beige can do is just try and survive one more day. Just try and stay alive. That basic instinct of survival, unfortunately, that's the only perfect day at this low level stage of development. So now we're on to stage two, the next level of human development in the spiral, which is stage purple. Now, stage purple, um, you can quickly think of this as very tribal. So you could think about sort of, you know, the Amazonian tribes, African tribes, people that still live like that even today. You know, it's very animalistic and they're more in a small clan, a small group uh, minded. But still, obviously, we're only on stage two here out of various higher stages. So this is like really low in the, the development uh, model. So it's still very animalistic, still very linked to survival. And of course, it's how human beings used to live, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. We all pretty much were in those tribal things where, you know, it was still very survival and there was tribes conquering other tribes and, you know, there was rape and pillage and stuff like that. So very base level survival, animalistic uh, way of being in the world. So that's the purple sort of regime, that small tribe, that small clan, that even within the same area are still trying to outdo other clans. So it's a very narrow circle of people who stick together um, in order to survive better, because out on their own they might, they might not survive. So we could start to talk about sex, drugs, business, <laughs> and my personal experience with, with, with purple. Um, but, um, you know, sex-wise, I don't really know. But, you know, I'd a guess it would probably be quite animalistic. Um, drugs-wise, you know, they could use a lot of drugs of the forest, which is like ayahuasca or, you know, the toad venom, which is uh, bufo, I think it's called. Or another name for that is 5-MeO-DMT. So, you know, they could use a lot of these spirit, mystical, mysticism, tribal type drugs a little bit. Um, think of uh, Stage Purple people, you know, in King Kong, the film, when they're out on the island and then they, they encounter all these, you know, purple people, um, Stage Purple development doing, you know, rituals and... And, and stuff like that in their tribes. They, they would be a stereotypical purple group of people. Um, or the people from Avatar who are there with their tribes and their tribes leader. You know, that's purple. Um, yeah, so those are just some examples just so you get the idea. 
Um, my personal experience with purple is a difficult one because again, it's so level, low on the level of development. But if I had to say, um, I remember doing a few rituals uh, sometimes. I've done a few spiritual retreats and we'll get to this when we go higher on the development. But a lot of sort of spiritual people will tend to sometimes incorporate some stage purple values. So there'll be sort of like rituals and stuff, whether it's like, you know, dancing around the campfire or jumping over the campfire or using sort of rituals to sort of like mark the end of like eras and stuff like that. I've done, I've partaken in a few things like that which I suppose could be a stage purple type ritual thing. But obviously, we're still very low on the level of development, so I've not really touched it. But there's an idea of purple. Like I say, I'm going to speed through these ones a bit more because the real value that you're going to resonate with is just coming later in the video, so stick with it. So I think that's enough for purple for now. Um, um, and uh, purple's perfect day, because uh, we're going to do that for everyone. Remember, beige is perfect day was just to survive. Uh, similar with purple, it's perfect day could be to survive. And, you know, a perfect day for someone at a purple level of development could be that they, you know, they managed to spear um, some animal and they got loads of meat and they're going to have a great fire in the cabin in the woods tonight and they're not going to go hungry for a long time. That could be a great day for someone at a purple uh, level of development. Okay, so now let's start getting to the juicier bits. So stage red. So stage red is the third stage in the spiral. We've got beige, purple, then red. And red is very, very, very sort of um, violent, aggressive, and egocentric. It's all about the self. Just so we note here, as we go through the stages, they actually interchange bes between caring about the self more and caring about the group more. So beige, stage one, was all about the self. Then it went to its little clan in purple where it was all about the group. Now red is very, very much about the self. So a stage red person will do whatever it takes to get whatever they want in the world. So think about, you know, murderers and rapists and, um, you know, crime people and villains and gangsters and, you know, the mafia. All that was sort of red. People who, if you cross them, they'll literally kill you. So, you know, tyrants. You know, we see some of this, though, in the Middle East. You know, we saw, like, people like Saddam Hussein um, and all that. Or, you know, all these sort of, like, um, people who've been upheld as, like, tyrants or dictators, I should say. Um, these people probably had a good bit of stage red in them. So, so what would business, sex, and drugs look like at stage red? And what is my personal experience of stage red? So business at stage red would just be a business that is willing to do whatever it takes to mess people over and make loads of money. So like I say, it could be the mafia would be a good example of a stage red business. They were making money and it doesn't matter if they kill people. It doesn't matter what happens to anyone else as long as, you know, they get their way. A uh, good film for this might be something like Scarface. You know, there was a lot of stage red in that. It's someone who will be willing to slit your throat to get what they wanted. Um, so that's what business would look like at stage red. Uh, sex, sex at stage red would be very aggressive sex, very dominant. Maybe there'd be a lot of... Um, like the, the dominant role plays in sex where, you know, uh, the woman, you know, at this stage it would be, is very, um, you know, passive, you know, and very like, you know, tied up and stuff. And the man is very aggressive, very dominant, very controlling, um, you know, maybe slightly violent sex or violent role plays. But all this sort of like massive shift of like, masculine and feminine energy, like a real polarity between someone who is dominant and someone who is, who is sort of being passive with that. 
So that would be an example of stage red sex. Um, and uh, drugs, um, just for fun, uh, stage red drugs would be the really low level drugs that can that can that can be very into this sort of aggressive dominant display of power so you know not even cocaine but the, the harder ones you know crack cocaine you know maybe even meth and maybe even heroin people could be around this red area um, but really something like I'd say crack cocaine something that gives you the feeling of like power um, and is and it puts you in that animalistic aggressive state something a bit like that I think would be the drug of choice and my personal experience with stage red um, would be well when I am um, I got mugged once which is you know someone tried to steal my stuff when I was in London walking down the street and I noticed then I felt really threatened and I think I went into a bit of a stage red state. So a stage red state could be a fight or flight mode state where like for once I felt like really threatened. I thought, you know, shit, there's no one here to help me. And if these people have got a, a knife or whatever, you know, it felt like a do or die thing. So then, you know, I was lashing out and this and shouting and punching like everything but it was almost like just a protection of like at that point I would have been willing to do whatever it took to survive you know so it put me in a stage red feeling of like I have to do whatever it takes here or I have to you know punch this guy out or this that and the other which I wouldn't obviously normally want to do but I feel like that was like a stage red moment I just felt it I can't really explain it you just feel that animalistic survival instinct where you would be willing to do whatever it took to the other person because you felt so threatened for your own survival. So that's a stage red example. So what would be the perfect day for someone at stage red? Well, it would just be to dominate the day and feel powerful, a massive ego hit. So it would be dominate the world, dominate their business, dominate their woman etc etc and feeling like they are the alpha they are the dominant one and um, so yeah they could uh, you know dominate another another gang or another business and uh, you know uh, another another mafia sort of uh, um, group and then they could win there and then they could uh, get their own way and it, it wouldn't matter to Red whether some people were really hurt in the process, they don't care about that as long as they came out on top and then they would probably have very dominant sex with their, with their partner, their woman and get their own way and they would just feel like sort of the barbarian there at the end where they, they'd, they'd done everything and they'd, they'd they were the powerful number one who were uh, who who they felt everyone else was the the little beta males and they were the number one alpha that would f that would be a good egocentric moment for stage red so now let's move on to stage blue now here in stage blue we might start noticing a few things this is probably one of the first stages where you're going to start realizing that you see some of this stage blue in the news, in politics, in the media. I'm going to be giving some more examples now um, and we're going to get a touch more in depth as we go from blue now onwards uh, through up the spiral. So stage blue is a level of development where again stage red has been focused on itself. Now blue is going back to the group, back to the collective. So instead of the small group of purple which was my little tribe now blue's more expansive and blue is like it's my country or it's my team or it's my church uh, could be a popular one it's my religion so stage blue can be categor categorized as people who believe in sort of rules order right and wrong black and white thinking, what you should and shouldn't do, you know. Uh, typical stage blue people would be 
yeah, people who are, you know, religious in a, in a certain way. Uh, it's not to say that all religious people are stage blue, but it's the value system. This is not a political or religious debate here. It's the value system that my religion is the only religion. That's a blue value system. It's a blue value way of thinking. So, you know, if you came up to some, you know, a Christian or, you know, someone who was, you know, in any religion and they were like, oh, this other religion's just as valid. Well, then that would be a bit more evolved. But if they're like, no, it's all about Judaism. It's all about, you know, being a Muslim or it's all about being a Christian or et cetera, et cetera. If it's about, they think that their religion is the best, that their country is the best, that their family is the best. You know, it's, it's, that's a blue mentality. So um, typical things with blue, just to put it in real world examples, are Brexit. Brexit over here in, in the UK um, was, a, was a blue type event because you had, um, this is why half the country in, in, in the UK when that happened was sort of around the blue slash orange. So they were more the leave people and then the other half of the sort of remain people were generally more of the orange slash green. But, you know, when Nigel Farage came in and he was all about, we want our independence. We're the independent party. We want to close our borders or whatever. You know, I'm not going to get into it. But, you know, independence, our countries, our rules, that's all blue, blue, blue mentality. Um, because as you get more evolved, those barriers start to open up and you start to work together more in a communal um, society level, which we'll get into. So some examples of blue, like I say, going through business, sex and drugs, and my own personal experience. Business at blue, this is a tricky one because you could have a lot of businesses at blue, um, but certainly they'd be very fixed and dogmatic about the way they did things. So they wouldn't be collaborating at all. But it could be anything really. You know, you could have a, a coffee shop, a, a, a bar, a pub, but certainly it would be a bit more old school. If you think about if you're in America, a typical blue uh, person will, will gravitate more towards the Republican Party and a typical, you know, stage orange green is more towards the Demo Democratic Party. Um, but so a stage blue person, again, if we had to stereotype a bit, just to get the message over to you, would be, you know, a Republican, you know, a redneck in, in the countryside sort of thing in America, you know, who's got his set ways of doing stuff and this is how we do it and this is how we've always done stuff, you know, old school. So just to quickly talk about my purse experience one with blue, at one point back in my younger days when I was a singer, I found myself in Branson, Missouri, um, which is nothing against Branson, Missouri. I had, a, I had a great time. But I remember like we were sitting there at lunch and someone would come over and say, there's a Bible, you should read it. Like proper stage blue. And even like the whole town itself or the whole, you know, I don't even know if Branson's a town or a city. It's a town, I think. But, you know, it was, it was like going into a time machine like a hundred years ago where, you know, people are sitting out on the porch and they've been doing the same jobs all their lives. So now going to business, it's like they probably do what their father did and their father's fathers did and their grandfathers did. It's this passing on of generations of like, this is what we do and we work at the farm or whatever. And forgive me here, I am generalizing, but it's because within this video, there's no other way of me just getting the ideas to you of sort of what blue looks like without some of these ideas and almost stereotypes. So it is more nuanced than this, but just to get you that feel and that idea that sort of like, you know, this is a Bible, you should read it, you know, um, and uh, they're not going to be open-minded blue. So I remember there was also like these people in Branson, Missouri, who were trying to sort of say, because uh, I was in a singing show where there was a few um, uh, gay uh, people. There was a few homosexual men. And like this was like a no-no because blue is so narrow-minded that like that's not the way you should do things. That's not what it says in the Bible. So that very narrow-minded, 
right and wrong thinking, very backwards, very traditional, very based on rules. Um, you know, that would be a very blue um, sort of way of looking at the world. So we talked a bit about business. It's probably something that's going to be passed through the generations and a traditional old school, old values business. Um, sex, interestingly, at Blue is just not really talked about, you know. So this is why, you know, if you're a proper Christian, you can't, um, you know, no sex before marriage. So sex is almost demonized at Blue, which is quite interesting. And it's funny, when I was out in Missouri, I was like, you know, chatting up a few girls. And I noticed they all had a wedding ring on. And I was thinking, oh, are you married? And it was like, I'm married to God. So, you know, that's a, that I was, I was deep, deep in stage blue and I didn't really know it. But again, that's why this spiral dynamics is so amazing because then when you read about it and you're like, oh God, this all makes sense. I just didn't know it at the time. But I knew that something felt really odd and different. I was like, well, these people are different. So, uh, so sex is very demonized, not talked about, it's very repressed, um, seen as a bit of a sin, seen, seen as a bad thing. Business, like I've, I've mentioned that, and drugs, again, would be a no-no. So drugs are a no-no at Blue, you know, you don't do drugs, uh, don't do anything like that. So it's very repressed in terms of that. So what would be the perfect day for someone at Stage Blue? So at Stage Blue, just for fun here, the perfect day would probably be that they they got up and they went to church and they did their chores, they did what they were told, they went around their church community or something like that. And then, um, you know, they, they worshiped their one God or their one thing and, you know, they did what they were told and they, you know, they, they were reminded of what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And they're like, right, I'm being a good person here because I'm not doing these aspects of life, but you know, I'm staying true to, you know, the people around me of what I should and shouldn't do, you know, and they would, uh, you know, not have any sex or not, um, not have any sort of materialistic uh, sort of treasures in life. It's just, you know, get things done. Uh, keep everyone happy, stay with tradition, stay with the values, stay within the rules, don't upset anyone. And um, that would be a great day for someone at Stage Blue um, to not cross the line. And of course, this builds up over time as well, because, you know, say you had homosexual feelings, well, you couldn't share that. You couldn't share that because, you know, you'd be, you know, outed from that particular small group you might be in in Stage Blue. So just fitting in, conforming uh, would be a great day for Stage Blue where they felt like they'd done their job, as it were. Here we are at Stage Orange, and I say this is one of the main ones because, you know, I'm living in London or just outside. Most people I know, are, I've got a lot of Stage Orange in them. It's obviously there is no main one, but generally where a lot of America is at in society, a lot of Europe, you know, a lot of the people who I personally interact with, so I have more experience with, is very, very stage orange. This has been one that I've battled with a lot. It's been hard to sort of transcend and outgrow. So let's get into stage orange because this is where things will probably start to resonate with you quite a lot. And you'll think, Oh my God, I thought orange was the highest stage. <laughs> oh man, I've got so much to say on stage orange, it's crazy. So let's get into it. So with stage orange again, we're going from this, 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 this change on every stage from uh, self to group to self to group to self-orientated. So whereas stage blue has been about it's our country, it's our religion, it's our way of being, us and them, Orange goes back to the self. So orange is more about individualism here. Orange is a little bit on the selfish side of life. So what orange wants in life is, the big things are success, personal achievement, and materialism. Could be the top three things you could say for stage orange. So, so many examples of stage orange, but just off the bat, orange in like an excess way and I got this one from Leo Gura it's just the perfect example is just like Wolf of Wall Street 
you know, it's all about getting more stuff, you know, getting more sex, more fame, more cars, more money, you know. Orange really cares about um, social status, so, you know, achievements and awards and acknowledgements and recognition. Um, but Orange, it's really just the materialism thing, you know, and the American dream, you know, of like the big house and the fancy cars and, you know, having sex with the hot men or the hot women or whatever. And, you know, the materialism of like social media and Instagram and taking selfies and, you know, fancy restaurants and fancy award ceremonies and fancy private clubs like celebrities and this is all doused in stage orange and it's all like capitalism as well. Stage orange is also where like a lot of business, science and technology comes into play. So a lot of like business, not all business, you know, there's businesses at every stage, but a lot of business starts in this stage orange, like entrepreneurship, I'm gonna make some money. This whole thing is very, very orange in a way. Um, so what does sex, business uh, and drugs look like at orange? And what's my personal experience with orange, of which I've got quite a lot. So sex at orange would be very, um, again, it's very materialistic. So the orange thing would be like, you know, the playboy girl and, you know, the hunky guy with the six pack abs. That would be a stage orange version of that. Very materialistic, very shallow. And ultimately, this is the best word I found, stage orange sex would be very transactional in its feeling. Very much like, you know, I'm just gonna have sex with this hot girl and then I'm done. And then I'll, you know, talk to my friends about how many girls I've had sex with and stuff like that. It's a very stage orange thing, right? Uh, business, again, stage orange is where business really starts, where business happens, where people are wanting money and entrepreneurialism. But it's not really entrepreneurialism that's quite evolved a lot of the time, where it's really trying to serve a purpose for the world, which we'll talk about in the next stages. It's more about the self so that, you know, I can, you know, go to my parties and buy my houses and buy my stuff and buy my fancy clothes and, and of course, put it all over Instagram and everything because I need to show everyone how well I'm doing. I've made it in life. That's Orange's way of thinking. So Orange businesses, although they're not going to slit your throat like red businesses, like the gangsters, but they will manipulate their way to getting what they want. Stage Orange will manipulate their way whether they have to think, right, who's useful to me if they look in a room? Stage Orange will be looking at everything in the world thinking, how does it serve me? How does it benefit me? How does knowing this person, this contact benefit me? Stage Orange is always looking at the world like that. That's how a Stage Orange person would see the world. It's what value can it give me? They're serving the self so that they can achieve more, so they get more money, more fame, more sex, etc., etc., etc. So in business, they'd want more. It would always be, how can we get more money? How can we make more profit? How can we do lower margins? How can we pay the people less? You know, like typical orange. Some of you might argue with this, but I think Amazon is a very orange business. You know, if you look at how they operate, um, of course, they're trying to pretend to be stage green, which is the next stage, as in like they care, but come on. Like if you look at how people uh, work at Amazon, if you look at what they get paid, if you look at how they get treated, and if you look at the massive juxtaposition of like the hierarchies of stage oranges, the people at the top get all the fruits of the labor, the money, the fame, and the sex, and the, f and the everything, whilst the people at the bottom, it's it's wage slavery, it's slave labor really. So Amazon would be a stage orange example of business, but most businesses would be stage orange. There's something different when the business is more evolved, which we'll get to with business examples of green and yellow. But uh, yeah, uh, stage orange business is gonna want profit at all costs. 
And with the drugs aspect, um, yeah, stage orange, a typical drug that stage orange would use would be just alcohol. You know, one in a party, one in a go to good clubs, particularly high end stuff. Everything's got to be luxury. Everything's got to be champagne and caviar and all this stuff. That's all orange. Um, but uh, they might use a bit of cocaine as well, like we saw in Wolf of Wall Street. So that materialism that, that heightens to the point where just, yeah, more this, more drink, more food, more private clubs, jets, more this, more cocaine. Like we see a lot of this in celebrity culture. We see a lot of this with how it is. So on the news, like people think stage orange is the highest stage. Like if I just get the house and the money and the hot girlfriend and the success and a great job on 100K a year, that's my life done. Like it's, it's crazy how much this belief system is put into society through the news and the media and celebrities and magazines where celebrities are on the front covers or what the latest TV person's doing, what the latest music person's doing. I mean, once you get involved, you're like, you, you see it from a different mindset. And you're like, God, this is deep stage orange to idolize these people, these celebs based on success and achievement. It's, um, it's almost laughable now because I spent so many years at Stage Orange and I still have a bit of orange in me. Another thing about Stage Orange, like I say, is science and technology. So science and technology rises with Stage Orange because it's all about efficiency and getting more done. And a lot of the people who would say, you know, science is truth, that's a very Stage Orange way of thinking, of looking at the world. Whereas actually, when you become a bit more evolved, you realize science is one part of a massive holistic collection that equals truth. But Stage Orange wants to stand behind science, technology, and how efficient they are, how pragmatic they are, how rational they are. Like, these are all more examples of a Stage Orange way of seeing the world. So my personal experience with Stage Orange would be nearly my whole life I like until I started learning more about personal development. So my whole life, like, you know, I was wanting to be on stage and sing. And not that there's anything wrong inherently of wanting to sing and be on stage. But point is my value system and my meaning behind it, looking behind it, uh, looking back on it, was that, you know, I wanted to be recognized or I wanted to be in the West End. You know, I wanted... I really cared about more subscribers or, you know, I cared about just getting more sex and, you know, buying fancy clothes and wanting to be, I remember having like an aspiration of like wanting to be a member at like a private club. And now I look back at it and I just see how hollow that was. Um, uh, and also with Stage Orange, like I say, it's, it's, it's all about achievement and social status and wanting to be recognized. So I didn't just want to do like a singing show anywhere, you know, it had to be on the West End or something because I wanted to feel like I was achieving something. And that's what life was about at the time when I was back more in Stage Orange. So some personal experiences is, is that, just like I say, a willingness to, to always want to be successful and, and, and do more and achieve more and to, to put up a status saying like, oh, you know, I did this or I got into this show or whatever. That was all completely Stage Orange. And a funny example that I'll give you on Stage Orange is I once had sex with um, a really, 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 really attractive woman. And the next day I was so down and depressed. And I was, uh, at the time, I didn't really understand what was going on. But now I do. It's like, because... And this is where we'll go on to it here in a sec is the problems and the issues with, with Stage Orange. So with Stage Orange, like I say, when you only believe in materialism, what happens when you get it? You know, there's nowhere left to go if you think that Stage Orange is the highest stage. So the mind also sort of knows that once it gets these things, whether it's, you know, fame or cars or houses or money or sex, more materialism, more subscribers. It just knows in the end that there's no real fulfillment and happiness in that. 
I've talked about this before. That's why I started studying hedonic adaptation. But stage orange is really like an addiction to like dopamine. It's an addiction to all these hits of stimulation, but you can't confuse that for fulfillment and happiness. So it's very normal that stage orange people down the line when they've experienced a lot of this will get very depressed or even suicidal. And that's what we see with so many celebrities. People wonder when they're looking at the world from a stage orange point of view, how are all these celebrities so depressed? Because they think of course that that's gonna make them happy, they've got the money. But of course you have to go through that, you have to transcend it, you have to experience it to realize that it's hollow. It's hollow. It's an empty victory in there. And when you do, this is when you start shifting over to stage green that we're gonna talk about in a bit because you're seeking more meaning and fulfillment. So while I could talk about stage orange for days or for years or for decades, but I used to think it was the highest stage and transitioning to more to green, which I would say I'm more down this line now where we're gonna go next, really emotionally difficult to do. So what would be a great day for stage orange? Well, stage orange is perfect day would be wake up and have, you know, uh, breakfast at the Ivy or something like that. I'll wake up in some swanky five-star hotel and see all this materialism and maybe uh, they get an achievement or they get an award or people are talking about them on social and, you know, they go to some private fancy restaurant. That would be a perfect day. And they meet some hot woman or hot man and they have sex and, um, Meanwhile, the whole time, of course, they're wanting to showcase how well they're doing in life. So they're taking selfies, they're taking pictures of them at these private clubs and private events. Um, you know, they get some more money, they get some more fame, uh, they post about it on social media, they get loads more followers. This sort of day would be a perfect day in the life of Stage Orange. There's my thoughts on Stage Orange on I think we covered everything, examples and sex and business and you know, where it could go wrong and my personal experiences with Stage Orange. Now let's move over to Stage Green. Okay, so now we're on to Stage Green, the next level in the spiral of development here. And this is huge because I remember the first time that people telling me about Stage Green, I was like, what? Stage Green, a level past Stage Orange. I was like, that can't be right. Stage orange is the highest stage. Oh, so like this might blow your mind here when I explain green. And I explain as well how hard it was for me to shift to green, but how fulfilling it is. So stage green, again, just to stereotype, to give you a quick idea, um, is going back to the group again. So stage orange was more self-centered. Stage green is going back to the, the group but instead of like the my country, my religion, it's more about like what's better for everyone. So it's more trying to embrace everything. It's more open-minded uh, still to try and embrace everyone. So stage green people typically are like the hippies, the hippies. So stage green people care more about the environment. They've gone from caring about themselves and their own uh, materialistic needs to what can I do for others? How can I serve more? How can I have more of a purpose? So they could be the hippies. They're probably gonna be vegetarians or vegans. They're gonna be more emotional. They're gonna be more about love and peace and you know, like the 60s hippies movement. Um, you know, they're gonna be, uh, they're gonna be doing their yoga they're gonna be doing their meditation. They're gonna be a bit more woke. They're gonna be a bit more spiritual. They're gonna be into chakras. They're gonna be into binaural beats. They're gonna be into, you know, starting to uh, tap into their emotions more as well. They're gonna be more emotional. Stage green is very emotional, whereas stage orange was more like a rationalist. So green can be overtly emotional, but it cares much. It cares so much about the environment. It cares so much about other people. It cares about hurting other people's feelings. So 
Just some tangible examples before we get to it. Now that you're starting to see, you can start to see a lot of the stages tend to clash. So you'll get people in blue and orange saying, oh God, they're the woke brigade. But the stage green people who are a bit more on the spiritual side, who are fighting for climate change and stuff, are actually more evolved than your typical stage orange businessman or your typical like stage blue sort of religious uh, fundamentalist. So um, yeah, stage green, just as examples with celebrities, you see a lot of celebrities, once they've achieved a lot, they'll either, they've got the choice of depression and stagnating in stage orange or moving to green. So someone like Leonardo DiCaprio, see, he's, 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 he's done so much uh, with his career that th there's no more fulfillment in that. So now he starts to talk about climate change. He starts to shift to, to green. Someone like Boy George, um, uh, the, the singer, you know, um, who I've, you know, seen and taught over the years, you know, very stage orange environment of the music industry. And you see him shift over to green. You see him doing his breath work, talking about Wim Hof. You know, you see him eating better. You see him doing some meditation. You see him shifting. You see so many. It's crazy the examples you can get into. But when anyone's past a stage orange and they're ready to go to the next stage, they will shift over to green. So some other examples of green would be uh, Burning Man is a great example where they're all, you know, in LA, they're all hippies and they're all love and peace and art and drawing on each other. And, you know, uh, meditation retreats, like I say, is one of my experiences. Um, men showing emotions is also a green thing. You could think of orange before it as like masculine energy and green as more like a feminine energy, um, which a lot of men are really not willing to go into. But in the end, you've got to go through that to become a more well-rounded man in the end. So let's talk about the business, uh, sex, and um, uh, what was the other example I'm doing on the more I'm doing business, sex and drugs, and my own personal experience. So business, a business a green is going to be more empathetic. It's going to be more, um, it's going to want more equality in the business. It's going to have a heart. It's going to have a soul. So think of a business that's more caring and kind. Obviously, the stereotypical green businesses could be, you know, people who are running yoga classes or meditation retreats, you know, they would be very green. But just the ethos and the feeling of a green business, you know, a green marketer, some examples of orange marketing would be like, right, do this, you know, do that, you know, read the book Influence by Robert Cialdini, you know, put them under pressure, sales calls, whereas green will be wanting what's best for the other person. A green uh, sort of marketer will be talking about things like kindness and empathy. You see sort of Gary Vaynerchuk, he's got a lot of orange in him, but he tends to try and skew these days more about happiness or just being kind or just being empathetic to the situation. Simon Sinek is another good example of business, but he's not really a stage orange type guy. He's always talking about empathy. He's always talking about like in his book, Leader Eat Last, that you've got to do what's best for the company. He's always talking about, hey, if you need a day off, then that's cool. He's talking about like trying to cultivate a great community and a culture within the business where people are more um, passionate about the cause, not just money, but a true purpose, like a heart and a soul behind the business. And again, if you just look at Simon Sinek or even Seth Godin talk about business, they're always talking about being kind, doing what's best for the customer and really sort of just giving them an amazing experience and leading with empathy and heart and soul. They would be examples of green people in business rather than stage orange who are just gonna get as much money out of the system as they can and they don't really have much of a conscience. So there's business. Uh, sex, so green sex, unlike orange, which was more sort of materialistic and, and transactional, green will be more like a, um, they'll believe in more ways to really be intimate, 
caring and loving and with their partner. So things like Tantra or Tantric sex, if you look into that, taking their time, feeling each other, almost like a sort of meditation through sex would be like a stereotypical green sex, exploring each other's bodies, taking time, massaging, you know, more sensual, more passionate, you know, more connection and more authentic connection just generally in the relationships. Whereas orange is not really able to talk authentically about their feelings and emotions. Green can really do that a lot better. They can be a lot more honest and authentic about what they're feeling. Um, and in fact, that's a very stereotypical example of green, um, which I'll get to from my personal experience. Um, drugs, now green, I think green's favorite drug, just to stereotype it, would be um, like weed. You know, the hippies smoking pot, you know, life's great, everything's cool, equal rights, you know, you know, um, that would be a, a thing. And also a lot of green people tend to experiment with psychedelics for the first time. Whereas Stage Orange didn't really care about psychedelic use. Um, stage Orange, you know, would just go for alcohol and cocaine, say that doesn't really shift your experience or your consciousness. Stage green is starting to get a bit more spiritual and not all green people do do drugs at all. A lot of them don't. But if they did, they would maybe experiment with a few psychedelic type drugs like mushrooms, say, um, a bit of weed, a um, bit of ayahuasca. Um, and yeah, things like that that will slightly alter their state and slightly try and sort of invite a group connection again. So my personal experience with green, well, when I did a meditation retreat, that was very green. Uh, when I do my breath work, like Wim Hof breath work or holotropic breath work, that's very green. You know, studying the chakras and how I feel, being more emotional, like being able to do my health video um, and sort of express emotion, knowing it's gonna go out to millions of people, that's a very green thing to do men showing emotions. Um, yeah, and, and I suppose when I did my ayahuasca retreat, that was quite a green experience. Um, so yeah, there's some thoughts on green and I'll just say that moving from orange to green was very difficult, very difficult, like, because the ego's got to shift. You've got to let the last part of you sort of let it die and let it go as you move over to stage green and you've got experiments like I was vegan for a while and I was vegetarian. I still don't eat a lot of meats. You know, I'm drinking my soy lattes. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling more, I'm getting emotional about things or I'm trusting my intuition rather than the logical mind. It's, it's extremely difficult to do, um, but it's worth it because you see the side of stage green that's like, is more fulfilling, is, is less sort of competitive than stage orange. And ultimately you get glimpses that there's more happiness and fulfillment in stage green. Now, having said that, stage green is still, uh, we're at the end of what we call first tier in spiral dynamics. All these colors that we've talked about up to now are all in first tier. And the next two we're gonna quickly talk about are in second tier. But stage green is still in first tier, which means it's like in level one, you could say the whole thing is, is in that sort of level. So stage green is not perfect. Stage green still thinks that it's the highest stage when it's not. Um, and stage green people tend to get a bit overly emotional, overly reactive, and they still want everyone else to be green. So everyone else should be a vegan. Or like everyone should care about climate change. Like they're still pushing a bit of green values on the world. They're not seeing the whole sort of, you know, dynamic. They're not seeing the whole spiral. They're just thinking that everyone should be green. And um, sage green people also because they they want freedom and love and 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 they want sort of like equality and you know, they tend to react against the last stage, which was stage orange, which was more about achievement and money and capitalism. 
So a good example of like someone stage green at the moment would be Russell Brand. And he's evolved really well. You can actually see his journey through sort of like even red when he was struggling with, you know, really hard drugs and sort of living a very, very sort of, um, you know, difficult life. Then he went through sort of the, the being a comedian and sort of the stage orange stage. And now he's going through green um, and he's got glimpses of yellow. But when Russell Brand is sort of talking about like the global elites are trying to put you down and put the normal man down, that's a very stage green type thing to react against stage orange. So um, Russell Brand's a really good example at the moment. If you look at through his YouTube channel and all the things he's talking about, where he's ranting against the elites, he's ranting against capitalism, he's trying to tell you how they're all trying to take your money. That's a very green sort of way it look in the world, which is which is cool. It's more evolved, but it's not still seeing the whole picture, in my opinion. And um, it's because, say, a lot of stage green people as well are still into their sort of like, you know, freedom and love. So they don't want to be tied down by everything. So we see a lot of stage green people, you know, that could be towards the conspiracy theory side of things or the anti-vax problem we've got at the moment side of things. Now, I'm not going to get into all this, but that would be an idea of stage green because they don't want to be controlled and they want freedom, love and, you know, expression. So it's, it's, it's more common I see that stage green people are more on the anti-vax side of things with what's happening with COVID. Um, so there's an example there where they want freedom and they want liberty and they don't want to be tied down. And they're sort of anti-establishment stage green, anti-corporation, because they're reacting against uh, orange. Instead of realizing in a way, which is what we do in tier two, that you know we can actually incorporate different aspects of this. So stage green is more evolved, but it's still seeing the world only through stage green eyes. And uh, it's got its flaws, but it's a necessary part, as is every part on the development of the spiral. Another quick personal experience example through stage green was um, I went to the 1975, the band, the concert uh, at the O2, and the opening was a song, which is one of the opening songs on one of their albums, which was just uh, Greta Thunberg talking about climate change. And so they're going through this and they're, they're actually a little bit stage yellow as well, which we'll get onto. But for a, a band to play a message about climate change in the middle of a sold out gig, um, that was a very stage green thing to do. So that's why I think I like the 1975. But um, yeah, so they've definitely got some green in them. Another great example of green is um, when you see someone like Obama um, crying. So, you know, stage red would never be able to show emotion and stage orange really, particularly because they're always worried about how they look, um, they wouldn't be able to be in touch with their emotions as much. So Obama's definitely got some green in him when he was talking about the shootings and stuff and he was able to just cry as a man as the most powerful person in the world, he was able to just shed a tear and that didn't diminish his power because he's so confident in who he is as a, as a holistic man. Like that was a great example of a powerful leader um, showing emotion and being okay with it that Obama's definitely got some green in him. Another example of green might be um, the Tesla car company. So you see, it's not all hippies and this, that, and the other. You can go into the car company and say, right, how do we make cars green? Well, if we keep these values of what's better for everyone else, what's better for society, what's better for the world as a whole, then the car company are going to come up with vegan leather seats and, you know, uh, renewable energy sources. So Tesla is an example. It's still got some orange in there. Of course, it needs profits to survive. But it's an example of why it did well was it was a green value based car company. And so we see with Elon 
A lot of people resonate with him as well, more than someone like Jeff Bezos, who I give as an example of Orange. And I think it's because they feel and see that there's more soul in what he's doing. There's more purpose. Um, you know, so that's why I think people like Elon generally a bit better than someone like Jeff Bezos. So, and and me as a final example, I would say that right now in the spiral, I would say that I've got a bit of orange in me that I just need to fully transcend and sort out. I'd say a good chunk of me is in green and a good chunk of me is in yellow. So maybe I'm something like 40% green, 40% yellow, which we'll talk about in a sec, and 20% orange. That's what I would guess. Um, but yeah, that's sort of where I'm at the moment. And so you can sort of start to pick, put yourself under sort of analysis and be and say, okay, where, where am I? What are these values with this? And wherever you're at, it's cool on the journey. So what would be a perfect day if you were stage green? So for stage green, a perfect day might be waking up nice and early at seven to see the sunrise or maybe earlier at six, depending on where you're at, to do some yoga on your nice little yoga mat overlooking, um, overlooking the beach. Uh, and then you do some breath work. You do some Wim Hof breath work whilst you're listening to binaural beats. Uh, and then you do some meditation. You do some meditating. Then you write in your gratitude journal. You're writing in your gratitude journal you're thinking about the law of attraction, you're thinking about abundance and all this sort of thing. So that would be a beautiful stage green day. And then you might, um, you know, go and have your vegan meal somewhere and you might uh, and, and, and go to a nice community that you trust, uh, a spiritual group. You go to your spiritual meetup, you all go around the room and you talk about your feelings you express your emotions, you talk about how, you, how you're feeling at the moment, they all listen, everyone's equal, you feel connected to everyone, you feel like you're connected to some more spirituality. This would be a great day for someone who is stage green. So now we're into the more evolved section, we're into tier two of Spiral Dynamics, and I'll explain a few of the differences here. We're into the really rare people in society here. We're talking maybe, uh, you know, 1%, 2% of the population. I don't exactly know, but something like that, you know. It'd be very rare to find someone who's very yellow that you know. Um, and these people are, are definitely more evolved psychologically. And uh, let's just talk about that difference between tier two now we're going into with yellow and turquoise. These are the final two stages versus tier one, which is everything we've talked about. The big difference is here that tier one, A, always thinks, doesn't know anything else but tier one. So it thinks that their perspective on the world, whether they're seeing the world from red, they think that's how the world works. From blue, that's how the world works. From orange, that's how the world works. And from green as well, they think that that's how the world works and that's how everyone should be. And each stage usually thinks it's the highest stage. Um, but of course there isn't, there's, there's stage yellow. So when we get to tier two, it's the first time with stage yellow that they see the entire spiral for what it is. It's almost like they're on a mountaintop and they've gone meta and they've zoomed out and they can see the journey and they see everyone now like arguing and doing this and then they're after materialism and then they're suddenly going about being a vegan and they see they just see the journey of everyone they see it for what it is and they see every perspective from everyone in tier one that we've just talked about they're also able to talk communicate and and sort of uh, be with sort of everyone from these stages so they're able to see the world through orange and understand because they've been there they're able to see the world through green they're able to see the world through blue so it's the first stage that is non-judgmental like oh god this is such a hard one but like this is a hard one because you're probably not in stage yellow unless you're like 1% of the population. So 
some of these things that I'm saying will sound a bit crazy, but some examples of stage yellow and the way that they would think is that, say you've got someone at stage blue who is very like us and them, our country and their country, and say because of that way that they see the world, they're a bit racist. Now, obviously, it's not a great place to be, and that's why it's a bit nicer if people go along the spiral and the journey. But say someone is a bit racist because they're at the stage blue level of development. Anyone at orange or green would say, you're racist, you're a bad person, right? But yellow would see, would zoom out and see the whole thing for what it is. Yellow is a systems thinker. So yellow would say, right, I'm not going to blame this person individually for being racist. What I'm going to see is that where did they grow up? Who were their family? What society have they been in? How have they grown up with a belief system? What belief system did they need to operate to survive in the world that they were in? It's no wonder they're racist. So yellow sees people, their attitudes and everything as a byproduct of their environment generally and their culture and their level of education and everything. Yellow will be quite complex in its thinking and stage yellow will take everything into account and it won't judge anyone on the level. It still realizes that there are levels and there's, there's sort of high levels, but yellow won't rant at someone for being racist. Yellow will zoom out and look at the picture as a whole and say, why is this person racist? What have they been through? What do we systematically need to change in society so that this doesn't happen? So yellow, like I say, is looking for systemic level, root level solutions rather than wandering around blaming people for being this or for being woke or for being, you know, a capitalist or whatever. So it sees the whole thing for what it is. That's the beauty of yellow. And it's able, like I say, to truly see the world from someone else's point of view. That's like a massive chameleon super skill that Stage Yellow has. Stage Yellow is also sort of characterized by, like I say, a systems thinker. And it's also very, it integrates a lot. It's like what Ken Wilber, the great teacher, would say is he called it integral theory, really, at the higher stages, which is, Yellow will integrate everything on the spiral to, for the complete holistic human being. So yellow will, so say if we use the example of stage orange and stage green. Stage orange you could say is more about um, being practical and being non-emotional, getting stuff done, achievement, success, and masculine energy sort of thing. Whereas stage green is the sort of yang to the yin and the yang here, where it's more about feminine energy. It's more about not needing to achieve success and being happy with what is. It's more about authentic communication, about feeling into your emotions, etc., etc. Now, one might be overtly selfish. One might be overtly sort of constantly self-sacrifice and thinking about others. But yellow is like always the perfect combination because it's learned from everything on the spiral. So orange might be say too much uh, when it wants to be on the masculine and green could be too much on the feminine side of the energy and yellow is a brilliant balance of both. Orange is too obsessed with materialism and green sometimes doesn't care about that at all whereas yellow will be like a chameleon hybrid of both and of course everything else on the other stages. But just to say that like yellow is the holistic integrator because orange people can be too obsessed with money, but green, like I say, can be so obsessed with them, um, you know, community and emotions and doing what they feel like that a lot of people at stage green struggle financially. It's the stereotypical, you know, hippie, like I say, because it's been demonizing the global elites and the orange. It's been demonizing orange rather than yellow realizes that there's value in every step of the spiral. And if I can integrate every useful step without going to the excesses, then I'm going to be this more holistic human being. So yellow person is 
really hard to pin down, but you'll know because they're generally more intellectual. They generally uh, have, they generally can tap into all these things and they're generally sort of, yeah, in that top 1% of their deep thinkers, they care more about truth and purpose and reality rather than achievement. Someone at stage yellow doesn't care anymore about social status or awards or achievement or recognition, not really. What yellow wants is to create systems to help the entire spiral move along. Yellow wants to figure out what truth is and how reality works and how people can be more connected to their life purpose, not to make money, but to be more authentic and beautiful in the world. So yellow is more on its own because it's coming up with systems and processes to help everyone along the spiral. So examples of stage yellow are um, the spiral dynamics model as a whole is a stage yellow model because it's looking at the whole thing and it's trying desperately to help people along by giving them the awareness and the tools of saying, this is what research we've done and it's, it's not favoring one point of view necessarily, but it's, it's, it's having a meta understanding of the whole spiral. So the spiral dynamics model is a stage yellow type model uh, in, 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 in and of itself. Uh, same with Ken Wilber's model of integral theory. Again, he's trying to study everything to put it all together to benefit, you know, human development. Um, Abraham Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, again, similar, very intellectual, and he's trying to put everything together for the greater good. Leo Gura, who I mentioned, you know, his YouTube channel, he's not ever just pushing one perspective. He's seen the world from all these different perspectives and he's putting it together. So a stage blue teacher would be saying, this is the method, this is the way, this is what you should do. And they might back it by science, which is stage orange. But a stage yellow, more advanced and evolved teacher and thinker like Leo Gura would be saying, okay, we're going to take this perspective and this perspective and this model and that model. And we're going to be talking about spirituality. We're going to be talking about finances. We're going to be talking about everything. And we're also going to be looking at different science, different technique, different levels of consciousness. We're going to try psychedelics. We're going to try everything and we're going to put it all together and that will give us the best aspect of the truth. It's not that science equals truth. It's not that spirituality equals truth. It's that all the perspectives come together into one giant sort of way of looking at the world that actually then laser beams to be the truth. So he would be a great example. And another great example that just people will know is again, Obama. Now, I don't want this to be everyone start ranting because they've got feelings towards Obama. Because what we're talking about here is a way of looking at the world in a value system. So every time I've talked about religion or politics, try not to get triggered by that, but try and self analyze and say, okay, well, let's, let's, let's go with this. So if you look at most politicians, the way that they might lie and manipulate to get their way, that would be a very stage orange. If you look at the Brexit thing, that was a very sort of stage blue in the political realm. Um, and if you look at sort of, you know, political activists who say, oh, well, if he doesn't agree with me, get out, or I don't want to talk to him. That is going a little bit stage red. But when you look at Obama, there's a brilliant clip I love with President Obama and it's it's like how Obama deals with hecklers and um, literally he's there and he's at this massive conference or whatever where there's thousands of people and some Trump activist um, shouts out stuff and everyone in the audience because they think they're trying to stick up for Obama is like going boo 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 to this Trump activist who's obviously shouting at Obama whilst he's trying to do his speech. And it's unbelievably a stage yellow move that Obama makes where he says, hold on a second, everyone, 
quiet down, let him speak. Let's hear his point of view, right? So again, he's not got ego in it of like, I'm right. He's like, okay, now let's calm down and let's notice a few things. And this is what Obama says is, firstly, he is an elderly looking gentleman and we have to respect our elders. Again, integrating some stage blue there in what Obama's doing. Then he says, and he's also passionate and I'm always gonna be up for people who are passionate about their candidates. Again, wanting what's best for the system. And then he goes on, and it looks like he served in our military and we have to respect that as a country where we've been from. You know, such a beautiful example of someone more evolved. We can tell Obama's more evolved by the way he reacts like that. If he reacted in a, listen, sit down, shut up and get out, it's so obvious now that that is someone who's lower on the spiral. But with Obama, to be able to first feel like someone is criticizing him and to be able to say, immediately see the world from their point of view, from their perspective, and what's greater for the, 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 the good of the whole is a systems thinking mindset. Someone who doesn't take anything personally, but is almost like a vehicle for the greater good. Um, it was very inspiring. It, it's incredibly difficult when someone's arguing with you. You try it. Try and get someone to argue with you on a point you're passionate about and say, and if you can react and say, hey, like actually you've got a point there. And I realized that, yeah, maybe I was seeing the world in that way, but actually, thank you, you've made me realize that. I mean, how often do you ever see an argument go like that or even a conversation in politics? It's because everyone's still in tier one and they believe that their way is the way. Whereas Obama was trying to integrate and put everything together and he was trying to come up with systems that could help the greater good. Of course, he wasn't that successful sometimes because he's dealing with a lot of people who are constantly stage blue and stage orange and they don't want to give away their rules and their laws and their rights. Okay, but Obama is trying to think He's a long-term thinker and he's trying to think what's better for the greater good. So there's enough on Obama. Um, another long-term thinker, holistic systems thinker, could be Elon Musk's got some of that in there. Um, the way he thinks decades down the line. So stage orange will think a month ahead and stage yellow will think decades ahead, maybe even centuries. Um, they have massive long time horizons would be a characteristic of stage yellow. Um, try and think who else might be stage yellow. Even reading Simon Sinek again, his book, The Infinite Game and an Infinite Mindset. Don't worry, I, I don't think he's pure yellow, but that is a marketing book that is stage yellow. Not how can we get more money in stage orange right here, right now you know, get rich quick schemes, to think of business as an infinite mindset that you can't win. Whereas Orange wants to win, Orange wants success. That to me is a stage yellow type marketing book, if ever there was one today. Um, and how you know if someone's stage yellow is if they've got to have gone through stage green. So, as a test, you've got to realize that they, they must have some green in them to be yellow. So again, with Obama, we've seen that he's been able to cry and show emotions, very green uh, a value from a president there. Um, with Elon Musk, he's got some stage yellow in him. And like I say, he's gone through the, um, you know, the electric car for the greater good. And I think he likes going out to Burning Man as well. Uh, and stuff like that. So it's a bit green, so he's got that in him. Simon Sinek, Sinek again, you know, how can we tell he's a bit yellow? Because you can tell he's very green in the way he talks about culture, kindness, love, and empathy. He talks about marketing as being about kindness, love, and empathy. It's a very stage green uh, way of thinking, and obviously he's slipping into yellow. So sex, drugs, and business. Business, we've already covered there. What a yellow sort of business could look like. A yellow business would want to uh, create a business system that helps everyone else uh, along the spiral, help everyone else evolve. Whereas an orange business just wants to still make money for itself 
and has competition, a yellow business will sort of integrate and say, right, how can we all work together for the greater good to help everyone else? Um, uh, a yellow sex would probably integrate again every other aspect of the lower spiral. So the communication would be absolutely amazing at yellow. Um, and they would probably lean obviously more towards uh, stage green sex, so tantric and stuff like that. Um, but stage yellow would be able to also experience all the different types of sex. So whether it's, you know, stage orange sex or this sex or that sex, or they'd experiment with this technique or that sexual technique. So yellow will be wanting to integrate all the different aspects that could make sex better. Maybe spirituality, talking about chakras, going to some sexual retreats together. I don't know. But you know, they'd want to integrate as much as possible to get the most out of their sex and not just have one perspective on sex. Uh, we talk about business, sex and um, drugs. I find that a lot of yellow people, again, like doing uh, psychedelics, but it can go a bit further than just weed and, and mushrooms. Well, weed, I don't really class as a psychedelic, but um, it goes a bit further. So a lot of stage yellow people like Leo Gura talk about taking 5-MeO-DMT, which is apparently like, like 10, 20, 100 times more powerful. I've never tried it. Uh, more powerful than, than regular DMT or the DMT in ayahuasca. So someone at stage yellow is so developed and conscious that they're after some very high level experience about truth and consciousness and reality. So I'd say maybe 5-MeO-DMT um, would be one that they might try. And just to finish off with that, my personal experience of stage yellow would be the fact that I've tried to, well, putting out this video is like a stage yellow thing because I'm trying to put it out for the greater good to inform people to get them going along the spiral. But even when, um, years ago when I was a singing coach, I often thought, you know, I everyone was trying to do one technique and one thing and they were saying, you know, science is truth to back it up. And I was like, well, I want to hear what Denmark has to say about uh, voice technique, what Germany has to say, what this person has to say. So I would be interested in lifelong learning and taking on all these different perspectives on vocal technique. And that's how I came up with my own sort of unique and what I found was the most truth Whereas most people didn't do that. So I'd say that that was a sort of yellow type uh, uh, aspect of myself. I'd say also that I don't feel like, even though I've got stage green in me, that I'm stuck in green. I'm able to be very self-aware. I'm able to analyze my own self-deception and realize what stage I'm in. Um, whereas I find that when I do talk to people who are just stage green, um, they are just stage green. And if you stuck them in a stage orange environment, then they wouldn't be able to cope with that. They wouldn't like it and they'd be easily triggered. I find that it's very difficult now to trigger me. I'm quite non-judgmental when I see people's journeys and their paths. Um, and yeah, it, it would be really quite difficult to trigger me now, I'd say. Um, even if you said some, you know, harsh at me, I wouldn't take that as an offense. I would take that as, okay, they're at this point on their journey. And if they were more evolved, they wouldn't have uh, said that, you know? So um, that's where I think I'm at with yellow. And also when I coach a lot, I tend to do a lot of Venn diagrams these days, where I'll have this overlapping to this, overlapping to this, overlapping, sort of like, um, yeah. And then there's like this center bit that's like truth. I found myself doing loads of these. Oh, it's a combination of this and this and this and this. And people are like, bloody hell, this is complex. But I think that's the yellow in me where I'm starting to see the overlaps in everything. Um, so yeah, it's a really exciting thing. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful place to be, but a little on the lonely side because when you're stage orange and you're fitting into the herd and the masses, it's easy to get along with everyone because everyone thinks like you. But uh, there's more, uh, it can get a bit lonelier at stage green, although it's very community oriented. But when you get to yellow a bit and when you start thinking like this, there's not many people think like you 
and you can dig into like say going to a private club where the stage orange people who are all dressed up and taking selfies of themselves but you you've transcended that so much that you don't get any satisfaction from that so it almost becomes quite difficult because a lot of the things lower down feel so like meaningless sometimes because you're after all these higher ideals of like finding my authentic self or seeking the truth about you know the world and you know it's not many people think like that so something i battled with a little bit more but i'll soon sort it out so what would be the perfect day if you were at stage yellow this one's quite interesting so if you were stage yellow i think a perfect day would be uh, you figured out this model or this system that you know is going to help everyone else and um, so maybe a perfect day is that you would have had aspects to green in you on a perfect day maybe you're still meditating maybe you're still doing your breath work maybe you're still eating healthy but really you've probably come up with some model that you, you, you've sort of figured out after all this time that like, oh, if I combine this model of spiral dynamics with this model and this model, then I found this new layer of truth that actually is, is deeper in its understanding and is gonna help people more. Um, and uh, I think something like that, although that sounds quite odd, would be a, a perfect day for someone at stage yellow. They still are human beings, so they still might want you know, a bit of sex or some nice food, but it's certainly not what they're about. They're about trying to help people on a holistic level and they have got a heart and a soul as well because they've, they've come through green. But I think a perfect day, like I say, was when they found some model that integrates all the things that they've been researching and thinking about that they're like, oh God, this is it. So say like the people like Claire Graves who came up with Spiral Dynamics, the days where he realized, wow, you know, it's, it's this combination of stage blue and this and, you know, like, you know, and he was starting to research and see patterns and he was getting excited by this profound truth that he could share with the world. That would be the day that someone at Stage Yellow felt the most alive, I think. Okay, so finally, stage turquoise, the highest stage, the last stage on Spiral Dynamics. Now, because uh, I'm going to be honest, I don't think I've really got any turquoise in me. The only experience I've got on this one is just from reading about it or watching videos, etc., etc. So even though we're at the last stage and I've been sort of talking quite a bit more as we've been going on, as it gets more relevant to me in my life and what might be relevant to you, like turquoise is so rare that it's hard to really it's hard for me to know about it because I haven't experienced it so some turquoise people could be people like Saad Guru again I got that reference from Leo Gura um, also I see I think Ken Wilbur is quite turquoise um, Om Swami he's a monk but basically we're talking about the very spiritual like yogis and you know people like just look up sad guru and you know we're talking about like mystical people you know we're talking about people who some people describe as like the monks you know people who don't need any materialism anything any and they're they're just like like hardcore meditators or something like that like i say it's hard for me to talk about but uh yeah, I read Om Swami's book recently, O-M and then Swami, S-W-A-M-I. Uh, and that was a pretty inspiring book. Basically how he was in a stage orange business and he moved over to turquoise. But turquoise is, is I can't, I, I just don't know enough to say properly. Even though I've read about it, I can tell you they believe in non-duality, that everything is oneness, that everything is the same, that everything is equal. They believe in spirituality, that they're part of the whole world, you know, that they are one with the animals and they truly feel they're one with everything. But it's hard to, it, it's, it doesn't do me or you justice by me just preaching from a textbook because I think you can see from the other stages, I understand it because I've actually experienced it, whereas this is just textbook stuff. 
So um, you could read the book on it and you might get a glimpse or an insight, but really when you start listening to Stage Turquoise people talk, I do appreciate it and I do really, like I say, I've started reading books from Turquoise authors, um, but I don't really grasp it yet because I think yellow is the peak that I've had. And um, I will say though on my little ayahuasca retreat, that I had this epiphany, which is just obviously a state that I was in that lasted a couple of hours where I felt like everything was like together. You felt like the ego was actually going down. You felt like you're at one with everyone at the room. And I don't mean at one like, oh yeah, we're all together. There's some very deep spiritual insights that sometimes I had to glimpse of so that's my only experience of turquoise is when I was on psychedelics it's just like a glimpse of like like everything in the world is the same like everybody is part of the same thing it's sort of veering towards enlightenment so it's really hard to talk about anything like this when you've not really experienced it so but check back on me in five ten years time and uh, maybe I'll be able to talk about it some more but uh, I would just look up people like Sadhguru, Talk and Om Swami and stuff like that. Just real monks and, you know, there could be an argument that people like Jesus or the Buddha as well were sort of these stage turquoise gurus who were sages and all this wisdom, um, you know. Um, but it's, it's really hard for me to openly talk about it. But I just wanted to reference it and maybe I'll put a link to like Sadhguru's channel in the thing. In the description so that you can just get an essence when you see him of like what it might be to be like a stage turquoise guru but like I say it's not something I can really uh, talk about because I haven't fully experienced it at all and I've just read about it so probably better for you to view them people and like I say if you're a bit lower down on the stages you'll probably view someone like Sadhguru sitting there in a robe and meditating most of the day and you know, talking about, you know, non-duality and understanding reality. And you, you probably won't even think that that is the highest stage, but it actually is. And um, it's just that when you get to that stage, like those people, they don't care about materialism. They don't care about awards. They don't care about achievements. They're just, I think they're so connected to spirituality and that they're just, so conscious it's almost this enlightenment aspect where they're just in like total bliss as it is so i don't think that stage turquoise people as well like do any drugs they're sort of in this blissful state of they've d d just so connected to the earth and themselves and gods and mystics and stuff that they're they're completely able to be completely fulfilled without any external attachments that's one thing I get from them. Um, so there's that on Stage Turquoise. I'll put a link to Sadhguru, maybe Om Swami's channel, so you get a feel of some Stage Turquoise people just to see what the highest levels of development actually look like. So what would be the perfect day at Stage Turquoise? Well, again, I've not really experienced Turquoise, so I don't know, but at a guess, like at a guess, this is the funny thing, like every day is probably a perfect day. This is the thing, like, I think they're just so content with being rather than doing. I don't think they'd have to come up with a model. They wouldn't, they wouldn't really care too much about a new car or this, that, and the other. I think when they, they're that evolved, it's like every day is nearly a perfect day. Even if things went wrong, they're sort of untouchable, these stage turquoise people, where they just see the beauty in everything. So... That's how to end our perfect day series at Stage Turquoise is that you become so conscious and evolved that like every day, no matter what happens in the external world, no matter what external factors happen, you're just a sort of vessel of truth, beauty, love and spirituality and every day is a perfect day. Okay, so that's it. In conclusion, thank you for sticking with me. If you stuck with me through this video, hopefully it was mind blowing. Hopefully you've learned so much. Like I say, you should read the book. I give full credit to everyone else um, who's d developed this model. But I hope it was eye-opening. I hope you, that you want to look into it more. 
maybe there's been some realizations and maybe you got a bit triggered along the way and then you can have that as a clue as like why am I triggered because if you're triggered you're probably reacting against one of the other stages on the spiral. So I hope you can tell I'm so passionate about it. I keep looking into this model and I will keep doing more research. I might keep referencing it a little bit along with other models. Again, it would be wrong to just look at one model, but other similar models like this, just to know where we're going on our personal growth journey, a compass of where we might be heading. And um, so I hope it's been hugely beneficial for you if it has, because it took me uh, a lot of a lot of sort of effort to to even put this together and research. So uh, hit the like button if if you did like it, or a comment on where you think you might be at in the spiral in the journey. Was there a, 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 a one of the stages like blue or orange or green, and you maybe thought, man, he, you know, you're talking straight to me, Chris here. Um, and what you thought about it and what you thought about the different stages and the order they went in. It's so interesting. Um, or if there's any accounts of your own life experiences like I shared mine, of you like, this moment was deep stage orange, this moment was deep stage green. I'd love to hear and I'll be commenting as well and happy to answer any other questions if I can, just from my own personal experience of going through this model within my own life and my own sort of researching it. So yeah, like and comment and please visit my website, ChristopherDavidMitchell.com. I've got some coaching on there. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and there's going to be more programs in the future where I can implement some group coaching so we all go along the personal development journey together. So check that out. Thanks for watching and I'll speak soon. Take care.